Um, so uh, today you're going to have the privilege of hearing two Antipodean accents. <laughs> Um, and, and you'll be able to directly compare between the, the New Zealand accent and the Australian accent. Um, so the Kiwis like to say that the Australian accent is kind of like an evil version of the New Zealand accent. We should take a vote at the end. Yeah, why not? Um, okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Scott Levick. Um, Scott is currently at the University of Sydney at the, um, the Colling Institute of Medical Research. Um, but he, he's actually spent quite a lot of time in the United States. Um, I, I, you know, we, we were trying to figure out this morning whether we'd met each other before, but he was at um, the University of South Carolina School of Medicine for many years, um, doing a postdoc with uh, Joe Janicki um, at about the time that um, I was also um, spending quite a lot of time there um, via, uh, via collaborations. Um, so he worked with uh, Joe for uh, five or six years, um, working on mast cells and, um, and a heart failure model. Um, and then went on to the uh, Medical College of Wisconsin um, in Milwaukee, uh, where he eventually got a K99, uh, double, double zero, which saw him um, taken into the faculty ranks, went from assistant professor to associate professor. And then, uh, and then after um, a few years of that, um, decided to head back home to the University of Sydney and he rose through the ranks there um, 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 to become a, an associate professor. Um, I should also mention he, he did his um, undergraduate degree at the University of Queensland and um, his PhD in biomedical sciences in the, in the heart failure field as well. So, um, and it's pretty much where um, Scott has stayed, heart failure and, um, and figuring out, uh, figuring out the, the mechanisms and the ways um, to uh, translationally intervene in heart failure. So I've, I'm really looking forward to his talk. I know he's got some really interesting animal models, including um, uh, um, uh, non-human primate models, that I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the data from. So without too much further ado, um, Scott, please um, take it over. I like this one. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and uh, talk here today and visit. I've only been here half a day and already um, very clearly have a very impressive uh, institute here and an impressive setup. So I'm going to talk about a um, couple of recent projects that we've been working on um, related to, to the neuropeptide substance P, but let's give you a bit of background first. So when, if you think about neural innovation of the heart or neurons in the heart, most people will automatically think of parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, right? So uh, parasympathetic nervous system being predominantly uh, acetylcholine to slow heart rates uh, and decrease uh, force of contraction in the heart. Sympathetic nervous system doing the opposite thing predominantly through norepi, increased heart rate, increased force of contraction in the heart. Uh, one thing that we don't usually think too much about is within the heart itself, there's actually a, uh, it's highly innovated. So this is uh, up at the atria here, and then even in the septum of the, of the ventricles, and between the ventricles themselves, there's these real, uh, quite extensive neural networks. And again, this is acetylcholine and, and norepi-based uh, neurons stained there. But there's also what gets even less attention is beyond neurotransmitters, there are these neuropeptides in the heart. Uh, and some of them are related to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, but some are also related to what's shown in the, in the dotted line here, which is the, the afferent system. So sensory nerves sending signals back away from the heart. But uh, this system also releases things at the local level of the heart too. So it's not just a signaling back to the, to the spinal cord or the brain, but it's also having influence at the local level. Um, and this just shows in the heart some staining for substance P and calcitonin gene-related peptide, just showing some of these um, sensory type nerves within the heart itself. So we're interested in neuropeptides. So, so not the neurotransmitters, but the neuropeptides. And then the difference being that neurotransmitters act rapidly and um, are uptaken or broken down rapidly, so, so short, sharp effects. Neurotransmitters are more chronically released and tend to have sort of more long-term chronic effects. Now, there's a whole bunch of neuropeptides within the heart and that affect the heart. And this is by no means an extensive um, list here. Some of them serve to be cardioprotective in disease. So CGRP is kind of the classic one that has a lot of um, cardioprotective type effects. Some of them 
drive pathology. So neuropeptide Y uh, works in concert with norepi to, to promote adverse effects. And then some of them do both. Uh, substance P is the example here. So very dependent on disease etiology and even timeline of disease as to whether it is protective or, or adverse. And so we've done a little bit of work with CGRP in the past. We have a, a study underway now with catastatin that's in its very early phases, but most of the work we've done is with substance P. And I'm going to show you two examples today related to fibrosis of the heart, where substance P is, drives the fibrosis, but it also can uh, be antifibrotic. So a little bit of background on substance P. Some people in the room probably have extensive knowledge of substance P, and some people are probably wondering why it has a name like substance P. Uh, basically, it's a sensory nerve neuropeptide, uh, although not exclusively, but that's kind of traditionally uh, its classification. It's encoded by the TAC1 gene, and it's the primary ligand for the neurokinin 1 receptor, so the NK1 receptor. So you, in order, going forward from here, you have to remember TAC1, substance P, NK1 receptor. It's going to get really confusing. So unfortunately, they didn't name them similarly to help out, but TAC1 encodes substance P, acts on the NK1 receptor. Uh, substance P is part of the larger tachykinin family of neuropeptides. This includes neurokinin A, neurokinin B, hemokinin. It's sort of the main ones there. And these tachykinins and substance P, they do a whole host of functions throughout the body. Vasodilation, pain, they modulate inflammatory and immune responses. They, they just do a, a whole range of functions throughout the body. Now, in the heart, the atria, there's quite a few substance P-containing nerves in the atria, but in the left ventricle, which we're uh, predominantly interested in, it's really, substance P is really contained to these uh, sensory nerve fibers that project to the coronary vasculature. So this is the left, an left anterior descending coronary artery here, which is the main artery to feed the left side of the heart, and there's these little substance P-positive uh, nerves here, and then this is a medium-sized uh, coronary vessel, and again, more substance P uh, positive vessels there. So this is really important, I think, in the role of substance P and this whole concept, the title says, a master regulator of cardiac fibrosis. So this localization is really critical, I think, to, the, to the, what substance P does. Because if you think about this setup, in something like hypertension, where you have an increase uh, in coronary pressure, then these sensory nerves are going to sense that and they're going to try and reduce pressure by vasodilation. So since, uh, substance P is a potent coronary vasodilator. So they would release that initially, try and normalize pressure in the coronaries. That's fine for a little while, but it, chronically upregulation of substance P then starts to uh, have downstream effects. And because of this positioning, these nerves are probably one of the first things to sense an increase in pressure, and hence substance P is probably one of the first uh, substances released in response to that pressure. So. We think it's upstream of, of a number of pro-fibrotic or adverse pathways in hypertension. Uh, and I'm going to show you some of that uh, data to make that argument. So before we get there, just I'm sure everybody in here is not heart people, so I'll just give a little bit of background on the heart. Essentially, heart failure is a, is a catch-all end product of numerous adverse remodeling responses that, that end in heart failure. So for example, if you get uh, an ischemic event in the heart, you get death of cardiomyocytes, scar formation that expands, and you get this thinning of the scar area, ultimately this big, dilated, thin-walled heart that can't pump blood around the, the body properly. But in other insults, like hypertension, you get a thickening of the walls of the heart, um, maybe even a, a smaller chamber, which may progress to this dilated phenotype, but it can also stay like this with a heart um, becomes stiffer, doesn't relax properly, and, and there's, there's um, <clears throat> backflow problems associated with that, increased pressures through the hearts and then congestion in the lungs, et cetera. And of course, heart failure, the starters are getting a little old now, but heart failure, of course, is a major problem. Basically, to keep it simple, red is bad, and there's obviously a lot of red on that, on that graph. So heart failure is a major problem that we still don't have a good um, handle on. And heart failure treatments haven't changed for a long time with the addition, of, exception of one uh, newer compound now. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's two, two sorts of heart failure. You're going to make me go over time now. There's two sorts of heart failure. There's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So reduced ejection fraction comes from this big, dilated, thin-walled phenotype. So essentially, 
it's reduced ejection fraction. The heart can't contract properly. It can't pump out um, required sufficient, amount, sufficient amounts of blood. The flip side, and that usually happens with something like an infarct, ischemic event. Um, the other type of heart failure is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And this is about 50% of heart failure cases now. So it's more this phenotype. It doesn't progress to the dilated phenotype. It's this thick-walled phenotype where the heart becomes stiffer because of a number of factors. One of the major ones is fibrosis, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, and so the heart can't relax properly. And if it can't relax properly, then the pressure increases within the heart itself, within the ventricle. That backflows to the atria, which backflows to the lungs. So you get this congestion and, and um, uh, pulmonary backup that way. It can lead to right ventricular hypertrophy as well. Um, so while there are treatments for the, for the reduced ejection fraction, um, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, et cetera, there's no specific treatments for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction right now. Um, so that's obviously a major problem since it's roughly 50% of heart failure cases. And so that's hopefully where our work with fibrosis comes in because fibrosis, well, fibrosis happens in both situations, but it's a, you know, it's a major underlying cause of the stiffening that happens in, in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Is that enough? <laughs> so well, I'll go back one quick. So while this gives you sort of a general overview of, of what happens at the remodeling in the heart, what you can't see here is the fibrosis that also occurs in, in, the, in the diseased heart. And fibrosis happens in pretty much almost all cardiac pathology. There'll be some de degree, some type of fibrosis take place. So fibrosis, of course, just being an excess, excess accumulation of extracellular matrix proteins. And so just on a physiological level, the extracellular matrix is, is really important in the heart critical to normal function. So it serves to align the myocytes, so make sure the myocytes are sitting where they should sit relative to each other. Prevents myocyte slippage, so as the heart contracts, it makes sure they stay in line with how they should with each other and they don't slip past each other. Transduction of force, so as a myocyte contracts, it pulls on the matrix, which then pulls, you know, can be, um, transduces the force to nearby myocytes. Uh, protection of myocyte overstretch, so not contraction, but relax relaxation. So as the heart relaxes, those myocytes have an optimal length tension relationship. So the matrix helps to maintain that. And then tensile strength. So this relates to structure of the heart. Um, and I think I really like this picture because this is, this is hearts that's been decellularized. So processes started here. So by the time you get to here, there's no cells left. That's just extracellular matrix. But it still looks like a heart. So it shows you how critical the ECM is in providing this tensile strength, which provides the, the general shape and structure of the heart. So the ECM is, is critical in the, in the structure of the heart. So when we talk about fibrosis, we usually focus on collagens. Uh, so 85% of the collagen in the heart is collagen 1, roughly 12% is collagen 3. In a human, it's around about 2 to 4 percent volume of the heart. In a rat, about 2 to 3 percent. In a mouse, it's a lot less, for whatever reason. Um, and this is just some picroserious red staining under fluorescent micros microscopy. So you can see the sort of the normal collagen here. In a hypertensive heart, these are all rats heart, rat hearts. In a hypertensive heart, you can see the, the collagen uh, sort of strangling almost, the myocytes there. This is a bit more extensive where there's been scarring and we've lost myocytes in there and it's been filled in by collagen. And then these are all sort of transverse cut myocytes. These are longitudinally cut. And so you can see the, the, the wavy fibrilla collagen there, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, cardiac fibroblasts are the main cell type producing the collagen. And we sort of traditionally think of them as converting to myofibroblasts to produce this excess collagen, although I'm becoming less convinced that that has to happen the more we do. Uh, and it's important, like I mentioned, left, left ventricular stiffness. So when you've got that collagen in there, the heart can't relax properly, so it's stiffer. You get increased left ventricular pressures, which become an issue. But also arrhythmias as well. So you can imagine trying to propagate an electrical signal through all of this. It uh, doesn't work real well. So, so fibrosis can also be arrhythmic as well. All right, so first of all, I'm going to talk about Substance P and the NK1 receptor in cardiac fibrosis in the hypertensive heart. And this is where we started off with this line of research. So we made the observation that TAC1, so the gene for substance P, 
is increased in the heart of the spontaneously hypertensive rat. And then this is the WKY, which is the normal intensive control. So TAC1, is, it's a, about a tenfold increase. Um, so it really ramps up and it follows very much the increase, so the longer dashes there, are the um, SHR, very much follows the increase in blood pressure. So, so we wanted to test whether that was playing a role in fibrosis was our, our major interest. So what we did was we took uh, these SHR, we started them at eight weeks of age, because that corresponded to a point at which blood pressure was still normal, normal-ish. Um, and we treated them with this compound, L732138, which is an NK1 receptor antagonist, so we're blocking the NK1 receptor. And we did it through to 24 weeks of age. And if you look, you can see that little dotted line in there, that's actually the group of SHR that had the drug. So all the effects we're seeing are independent of blood pressure, it didn't reduce blood pressure at all. And so what we found is in the SHR, as is well known, there's this uh, fibrotic response, so an increase in collagen volume fraction. So this is just picrocerous red staining again, just under uh, light microscopy, not fluorescence this time. And you can see the fibrosis that develops in the SHR. So when we blocked the NK1 receptor, we were able to completely uh, prevent that fibrotic response from occurring. And so we did this also in mice with substance P knocked out, so TAC1, these are TAC1 knockout mice. We gave them ANG2, ANG2 gives you a really nice, robust fibrotic response, and that doesn't happen if you knock out TAC1. So whether it be knocking out substance P, blocking the receptor, rat, mouse, um, substance P through the NK1 receptor is driving that fibrotic, pro-fibrotic response. So what we wanted to know then, so one of the things we looked at was myofibroblast numbers, and we did this with alpha smooth muscle actin. Now, of course, smooth muscle cells have that uh, indicated by the yellow arrows here. So this was, we excluded those cells. So this is counts of uh, interstitial um, alpha smooth muscle actin positive cells as myofibroblast. So with the SHR, there's this uh, robust increase. And with the NK1 receptor antagonist, we were able to prevent that. So we were having some effect on fibroblasts in terms of being able to reduce that number as, a, as an antifibrotic response. So we wanted to know, the substance P have, did it have direct effects on the fibroblasts? And so we, and fibroblasts, cardiac fibroblasts do have the NK1 receptor. Uh, there's multiple bands there because there's actually two isoforms of the receptor and then there's varying levels of glycosylation. I'm, I won't go into isoforms in the name of time, but if anyone's interested, um, can ask me about that at the end. But fibroblasts, cardiac fibroblasts do have the NK1 receptor. And so we took, we isolated cardiac fibroblasts, we treated them with substance P, we assumed that they would convert to myofibroblasts and make co excess collagen. And that of course did not happen. Uh, we used EDA fibronectin as an early marker of myofibroblast conversion because we, when we did alpha smooth muscle actin, we saw the same thing, nothing. So we thought we'd maybe we'd look at it for an earlier marker, but it's, again, there's no myofibroblast conversion. Uh, hydroxyproline is the, the surrogate assay for collagen production and giving substance P does not cause collagen production. This is high serum just to show that the cells are alive and functioning and can make excess collagen. And migration, there was no difference in migration with increasing concentrations of substance P. So there wasn't, at a basic phenotypic level, substance P was not driving a profibrotic phenotype in these fibroblasts. But what it does do is some interesting um, things at the, at the gene levels, so this is all RNA. Now the, the solid bars are rat cardiac fibroblasts, the, the striped hashed bars are actually monkey cardiac fibroblasts. We did a comparison to see if they were similar. Um, so we looked at a few genes in, that are important to fibroblast function. One is MT1 MMP, so MT1 MMP is important in liberating TGF beta, which of course is probably the most potent profibrotic molecule in the heart, uh, and again, Substance P upregulates this at the gene level in both the rat and the monkey. ICAM-1, important uh, he adhesion molecule, it's upregulated in the rat, in the monkey, and then integrin alpha-5, which is also important adhesion molecule, up in the mouse, uh, sorry, up in the rat and up in the monkey. So substance P, and, and this is just the three examples of, of several that we saw, we looked at. Substance P upregulates these important, important um, well, what will be important proteins, but upregulates them at the gene level that's the 24 hours. If we wait to 48 hours, it's all shut down again. So it's like it primes these fibroblasts for a response, but you need some other signal to come along, otherwise it says false alarm, switches off. So, but what else it does do as part of this priming effect is upregulate ETA receptor. Uh, so this is the receptor for endothelin, and this is the profibrotic receptor for endothelin. So endothelin is known to be profibrotic, 
by this receptor. So in addition to upregulating those genes, it upregulates this ETA receptor. This is at the protein level now, so this isn't gene, this is protein. But what it also does is if, when we went back to the whole heart and looked at these animals, there's an upregulation of, end, of endothelin in the whole heart, and that's regulated by the NK1 receptor. So substance P, it's almost like there's these safety mechanisms in place. It, it acts at multiple levels. In and of itself, it doesn't do anything to the fibroblast, but, but in the whole heart scenario, it's doing acting at several points to drive this pro-fibrotic um, sort of process. So essentially what you've got is the sensory nerve, which like I um, showed you earlier, could sense that increase in coronary pressure, releases substance P. Substance P acts on the fibroblast to, at the gene level, upregulate MT1, MMP, but also increase ETA receptors on those fibroblasts. Then it's also increasing endothelin levels, which regulate endothelin levels, which you see here, and of course, then that, that endothelin is going to act to the ETA to drive increased ECM. And endothelin is well known to cause ECM production from fibroblasts through MT1 MMP. So that brings the whole, brings it full circle. Sorry. No, go. Is there a, maybe you're going to get to this, but is there a feedback mechanism with respect to some signal from matrix to the sensory nerve terminals to limit? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. I have no idea. No idea. I'm guessing no, in that it proceeds to fibrosis. So, it, at least under these circumstances, it's not. Um, and I don't know. I mean, if you think where those nerves are, I guess that's that there is that perivascular collagen there. So there could be some some signal there. We we haven't looked at that. So what we did, we we actually had access to some. Um, patient samples. So we looked at some hypertensive patients just to see whether this, uh, this um, substance P endothelin relationship existed in, in humans. So measures plasma substance P levels, plasma endothelin levels. And actually there's a, there's a significant and moderate correlation between uh, increasing cor uh, substance P correlating with an increasing um, endothelin levels in these hypertensive patients. But it seems to be a male driven response because when you come to the females it basically is non-existent. So this relationship between substance P and endothelin seems to be a male-driven response. And our, our, the, ra the rats that we used in, our, in the studies that I showed you just a minute ago were all males as well. So if we did it females, we might see something different. So I talked about at the beginning substance P being a master regulator of fibrosis, which implies it's upstream of multiple pathways. So I've just shown you interactions with endothelin to drive that. Uh, another thing that we're interested in is mast cells, and this goes back to my postdoc days. So we showed way back in 2009 that if you inhibit mast cell degranulation, you can prevent uh, this fibrosis that occurs in the SHR. And actually, if you go, if you use mast cell deficient mice, uh, you can show the same thing. So these kit a mast cell deficient mice, so I'll come back to them again later. But if you give a mouse angiotensin 2, it develops fibrosis. If you give a mast cell deficient mouse ang2, you don't get any fibrosis. If you reconstitute the mast cell deficient mice with mast cells, you can restore the fibrotic response. So mast cells are uh, clearly important, and there's numerous other papers that we have done, others have done, showing that mast cells drive the fibrotic response. How does that relate to substance P? Well, mast cells, which are the red here, love to make physical connections with, with nerves, uh, not just in the heart, not, this is in the heart, but in other organs too, uh, nerves being in green. And this electron micrograph just shows, so you can see the big mast cell here, and you've got one nerve marked by N there and another nerve marked by N there. So mast cells and nerves love to make connections and interact with each other. And we had had some data from way back that um, if you treat isolated cardiac mast cells with substance P, you can get this, uh, you do get a release measured by histamine release. Now, obviously, this is taking really high concentrations to get this response, so we never sort of knew was it physiologically relevant or not, but there was enough there to think could substance P also be driving the mast cell response or mast cells mediating the substance P's profibrotic response. So the first thing we looked at is in the hypertensive heart, there's an increase in mast cells, but it's not actually, you don't actually get an increase in mast cells per se. The number of mast cells is the same. What you get is a shift from immature mast cells to mature mast cells. So mast cells exist as immature cells, which don't have a lot of protease, and then they become mature cells, which have a lot more protease, which is then what they release to do, their, to do the job. So in a hypertensive heart, so blue here is immature, 
and uh, red is mature. So in a normal heart, there's very few mature mast cells. They're mainly immature, and you can see this up here. So this is alcium blue and saffron and staining. So the alcium blue is taken up by the immature, and the saffron is taken up by the mature mast cells. So that you get this big increase in mature mast cells. Uh, with the NK1 receptor antagonist, we were able to really um, shut that response down. So there's not an increase in mast cells per se in the heart, but you get more mature mast cells, which of course means that there's more protease ready to be released. So tryptase, which is known to be pro-fibrotic in the heart, is increased in the SHR. And again, with the NK1 receptor antagonist, we can stop that. So, so substance P, NK1 receptor are putting more mature mast cells in place, more protease there ready to be used. Uh, we had a quick look at how it was doing this. So stem cell factor is, I mean, the hundreds of papers showing stem cell factor is essential to mast cell survival, proliferation, uh, maturation as well. And in the SHR, there's a big increase in stem cell factor, and that's driven again by um, substance P and the NK1 receptor. We just had a quick look with um, in situ hybridization to see what cells were making it. Traditionally, you think about fibroblasts as making it, but it turns out that even quite a lot of myocytes make it. Uh, endothelial cells it was coming from. But this is not, the whole heart section doesn't look like this. There's areas that seem to be releasing stem cell factor and that, I don't know whether that ultimately corresponds to where you get fibrosis or not. We didn't look at that. Uh, we did consider the possibility that maybe there were more mast cells, more mature mast cells just because there was reduced apoptosis of those cells. Uh, we had to go in vitro for that, but we did uh, bone marrow derived mast cells and we looked at cleave caspase 3 in response to substance P and we looked at um, apoptosis inducing factor in response to substance P and neither of those changed. So it doesn't seem to be any sort of effect on apoptosis. It seems to just be upregulation of stem cell factor which promotes maturation of mast cells. So then of course the big question is, <coughs> substance P is putting more mature mast cells in place, is it activating them to cause release of the proteases to promote fibrosis? So we had to, before we could, this is where the, so we had to turn to the mast cell deficient um, mouse for this. So before we could do that, we needed to know a few things. One was that the mouse substance P was important in the mouse, and this is the, just the data I showed earlier with the fibrosis. So if you have TAC1 knockout, give them ANG2, they don't develop fibrosis. So substance P is important in the mouse. We needed to know that mouse cardiac mast cells had the NK1 receptor. So we did some flow cytometry, and they do, and it's 90-odd percent of uh, cardiac mast cells have the NK1 receptor. There's no change with ANG2, but I suppose if almost all cells have it, there's not a lot of room to move there. The other thing we needed to know was if we reconstituted mast cell deficient mice with mast cells, could we um, get them to the heart? So it had been shown in other organs with this particular strain of mast cell deficient mouse, but it hadn't been shown in the heart. So we took bone marrow derived mast cells, incubated them with Q dots, which are these fluorescent, um, basically nano dots. Um, <clears throat> once they're taken up in the cell, they stay there. So we injected those mast cells into the mouse and then looked at the heart. So any fluorescence is these mast cells that were um, full of Q dots so we can show that we could get them into the heart. And so the big experiment was if the NK1 receptor on mast cells is important to their activation, then if we put mast cells back into the heart that don't have the NK1 receptor, we should not see fibrosis. And that is exactly what did not happen. So <laughs> you can see in the mast cell deficient mouse, you don't develop fibrosis with ANG2. Put normal wild type mast cells back in, you restore the fibrotic response. Put mast cells back in without the NK1 receptor, you still get that fibrotic response. So the NK1 receptor, substance P, puts more mass, more mature mast cells there, but it's not activating them. And this, we see this over and over again with substance P. It'll do as part of the task, sets things up, but there needs to be something else come along. And I guess it's safety mechanism, so you don't just develop fibrosis at the drop of a hat. All right. So we still don't know what's activating these mast cells. This is an ongoing uh, issue for us. I can tell you it's not the NK1 receptor. It's not stem cell factor. We, we looked at that as well. It's not TNF-alpha either. Um, we have some other candidates, but that's sort of ongoing stuff that we're still, still trying to figure out. But I, I'll bet my bottom dollar that whatever it turns out to be, substance P is regulating that, just like back at the endothelin. It increased the ETA receptor, but also upregulated endothelin. So. I'm guessing it's all going to be connected in the same way. So thinking about this from a, I guess, a translational level, what, what does this give us over current approaches to, to the heart, fibrosis in the heart? So current approaches are more aimed at blood pressure, so they're not specifically uh, targeting fibrosis per se. 
the NK1 receptor antagonist, as I showed, doesn't change blood pressure. So this is not reliant on uh, decreasing blood pressure. It's having effects direct to the heart without the need of, to reduce blood pressure. So that's going to be important in individuals where blood pressure is not well controlled. So this could be an adjunct. It's not going to replace your hypertensive therapies, but it could be an adjunct treatment to, to specifically target fibrosis. But the big advantage that we see here is this tip of the iceberg concept. Helps if I press the right button. Uh, and that gets back to this idea that substance P is upstream of all these pro-fibrotic pathways. So I showed you endothelial and I showed you mast cells. We have some data that's upstream of TGF-beta as well. I haven't shown that because we don't have very much and in the name of time. But that puts it upstream of three major pro-fibrotic pathways. So rather than targeting a pathway individually with the NK1 receptor antagonist, you can actually target multiple uh, pathways that all converge in fibrosis. And that gets back to what I was talking about at the beginning with the localization of these sensory nerves around these coronary vessels. They sense pressure, release substance P. So substance P is probably going to be one of the first uh, molecules released, and then it serves to activate all these downstream pathways to promote fibrosis. So now that I have hopefully convinced you that substance, too much substance P is prefibrotic, I'm now going to try and convince you that a lack of substance P also causes fibrosis just in a different setting, in diabetes this time. And this gets to this concept of substance P is good, it can be bad, just depending on the etiology. So this came out of a couple papers in the last couple of years that showed a decrease of substance P in the diabetic rat heart. And that loss of substance P, so usually if you give ischemia and then you give reperfusion or post-conditioning that has uh, protective effects. So those protective effects were lost in the diabetic heart uh, in correlation with this loss of substance P. If you replace substance P, you could restore the protective uh, properties of reperfusion and post-conditioning. So we wondered whether that extended beyond ischemia in the, in the diabetic heart and to diabetic cardiomyopathy, which is fibrosis and hypertrophy. So to look at that, we went to this leptin receptor DB mouse. <clears throat> uh, it has a mutation in the leptin receptor, which means it just eats and eats and eats. It can't satisfy hunger. So you end up with this little diabetic obese ball of mouse here. They're literally double the size of a mouse, just round. Um, so, we, so we went through this model for a couple of reasons, which I won't go into, uh, unless you're interested at the end. But what was important was, did they have reduced levels of substance P, which they do. It's about, about a 50% reduction. This is plasma, uh, oh, serum, sorry, serum substance P levels. So we had a model, it's diabetes, it had reduced substance P. So what we did was we, get, we took them at 12 weeks of age, and they're already obese, they're already diabetic at this stage, and we gave them daily injections of substance P for four weeks, looked at them at 16 weeks of age. And fibrosis was our primary endpoint, but we looked at body weight, so substance P didn't alter body weight, substance P did not alter blood glucose, and it didn't change blood pressure. So any changes we see in the heart are not due to altering obesity or altering diabetes or, or blood pressure. Uh, we did not see any hypertrophy. So in diabetic cardiomyopathy, hypertrophy is one typically described, but we didn't see any hypertrophy in these uh, mice, whether it be LV or RV. Uh, and there's no change in lung weight, so they're not in heart failure yet. So these, these leptin mice, these DB mice, uh, they developed fibrosis. So this is at 16 weeks of age now. And then when we gave the daily injections of substance P, uh, we were able to attenuate that uh, fibrotic response. So in other words, that loss of substance P predisposed those hearts to developing fibrosis. So when we put it back, we could at least attenuate that response. Now we gave, substance P has a fairly short half-life, and we only gave one injection a day, so that may be why we only saw about a 50% reduction, but could also be that, other, that, that there are other neuropeptides that, go, that are lost in diabetes too, so maybe they're contributing to the, to the rest of this. We're not sure at this stage. But clearly putting that substance P back was able to um, prevent that or reduce that fibrotic response. So we wanted to know, similarly to what we do with the hypertension, we wanted to know whether this was a direct effect of the fibroblast, the cardiac fibroblast. And we did uh, mouse and rat cardiac fibroblasts. Under high glucose conditions, they make lots of collagen. You see a big increase in collagen. Uh, as we added in increasing concentrations of substance P, we were able to reduce that response. We get a really nice uh, dose response in the rat ones. So substance P is doing something at the level of the fibroblast to protect them from that, from the, the high glucose induced prefibrotic phenotype. Now this, this study is a bit more, it's, um, we haven't been doing this as long as the other one is the hypertension, and it's a bit more 
translationally focused, so we haven't gone into depths in that yet, but we, we are going to. Uh, we think it's oxidative stress is one pathway um, that, that it's uh, modulating. But there's clearly a direct effect at the fibroblast. The other thing, in diabetic wound healing, um, substance P has been shown to, to improve wound healing by resolving inflammation. So we, we thought maybe it's, it's also having some sort of anti-inflammatory effects in those uh, diabetic mouse hearts. So we looked at macrophages, and you get this, this robust increase in macrophage numbers in diabetic heart. We didn't see much of a decrease with substance P, maybe a slight effect, uh, but certainly nothing major. So it's not reducing the number of inflammatory cells to any big degree, but what it did do was dramatically reduced IL-6 levels. So IL-6 is a major pro-inflammatory, pro-fibrotic cytokine. Uh, we looked at IL-17 and TNF because they had been reported to be up in diabetic, diabetic heart, but we didn't see um, anything there. But so, so while substance P is not reducing macrophage number, it's certainly uh, having an effect on, on at least IL-6 as a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And there's quite a bit of data now that substance P pushes macrophages from the M1 to the M2 phenotype. So we're wondering if that what, that's what might be happening here because as, as far as I know, IL-6 is an M1 um, marker. So by getting rid of that, we may be, may be pushing it from M1 to, to M2 and that's something we're going to explore further. All right. So like I said, this, was, this project was aimed a bit more translationally. So we have collaborators at Wake Forest uh, who have these monkey cohorts of monkeys, these diabetic monkeys. So we wanted to know, did they have fibrosis? And if they had fibrosis, did it relate to low levels of substance P? So we looked at fibrosis with cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. So extracellular volume is a metric from that uh, that correlates with fibrosis. So these diabetic monkeys, um, they had clear fibrosis in these hearts. And we, had, we were able to uh, do histology on a couple um, that died, and, and again, there's, there's clear fibrosis there in the monkey hearts. So the question for us was, if they had this fibrosis, do they have low levels of substance P? So that we, this relationship that we had established um, causal effects in, in the mouse, did, did it, the relationship exist in the monkey? And it does, and they have pretty dramatically reduced levels of substance P, actually. So while we showed a loss of substance P predisposes the heart developing fibrosis in the mouse and showed that causal causation by putting substance P back. Uh, this tells us that in a large animal preclinical model, that relationship exists there too. So with that, we then went and looked at some diabetic patient samples. So uh, we had 47 and 41 samples. Substance P levels. So again, there's a clear loss of substance P in these diabetic patients. This is plasma. This is very similar to what we saw in the mouse, um, about a 50% reduction. So to look at a marker of fibrosis, we, we only had plasma samples. So we used a um, biomarker, PICP, which is pro-collagen 1 C-terminal peptide. So it's a cleavage product of collagen as it's secreted from the cell. And then um, that, that pre-peptide, uh, pro, uh, the PICP component is cleaved and released, and you can measure it in the plasma. So we looked at PICP, and there was an increase in these diabetic patients. So this relationship of a loss of substance P and an increase in a marker of fibrosis also existed in these diabetic patients. Now, PICP in this setting is, is not just going to be the heart, obviously. It could be any organs. But this, this relationship may be important in, in other organs, too. We've only looked at the heart, but from now on, we're going to look at the kidneys and, and uh, other organs as well. So we did a um, linear regression analysis accounting for adjusting for age and gender. And so it shows that this, this relationship exists whereby as substance P levels decrease in these diabetic patients, PICP uh, increases. Now, there's an obvious question that comes from this. So I've shown you in diabetes, there's a loss of substance P. Uh, but in hypertension, there's an increase in substance P. So there's a whole bunch of diabetic patients that have hypertension. So what happens in that situation? So it's, it's really interesting. Basically, diabetes wins. So this, this graph is taking this population and splitting it into patients without hypertension and patients with, so they're all diabetic. Uh, so even if you have hypertension, diabetes beats hypertension, so you have a loss of substance P. And when you think about it, it makes sense because diabetes causes a peripheral neuropathy. So if you're getting degeneration of the nerves that produce substance P, well, then they can't produce it. It doesn't matter if you've got a stimulus there that would ordinarily increase levels. If there's nothing there, you can't increase what's, what's not there. So it kind of makes sense if you think about it that way. But 
what this does is if you, from a treatment point of view, it makes it easier because then you just treat diabetic patients as diabetic patients having a loss of substance P. You don't have to consider are they hypertensive, do they have more, that, that sort of scenario. So it simplifies, simplifies a potential treatment down the line. Uh, for completeness, we thought since we looked at rat and mouse cardiac fibroblasts, we should look at human fibroblasts. Uh, so under high glucose conditions, they make lots of collagen. And again, as you give substance P, you start to see this um, decrease in collagen production. So again, a, this direct effect at the fibroblasts. What was interesting, we had a look at IL-6 and IL-10 in these uh, patient, uh, human fibroblasts. Um, this didn't come out significant, but there's a pretty clear... Um, trend that when you give high glucose, you get upregulation of IL-6, and then with increasing substance P, that IL-6 begins to be switched off. And that fits with what we observe with IL-6 in the um, diabetic mice. So there's give, substance P is opposing this pro-inflammatory type phenotype in the fibroblast, but it may even be inducing a, a small anti-inflammatory effect. So IL-10 is often uh, considered as anti-inflammatory. So it may be hitting both sides, uh, potentially. So from a, again, taking it translationally and treatment point of view, what, what are the potential benefits of, of giving back substance P to diabetic patients? Well, it's not going to be a standalone treatment because it didn't alter blood pressure, it did not alter body weight. So it's, it's not going to be, uh, it's going to be given in conjunction with typical diabetes type treatments. This has direct actions on the heart. So there's a lot of controversy about um, certain diabetic medications and, and cardiovascular effects, but this is having direct effects on the heart uh, including inflammatory cells potentially and fibroblasts, so you so you're actually getting um, to the to the core problem, and like I said, independent of lowering uh, blood glucose levels. So, what I will add is, probably the end result of this is not going to be to give substance P. So we start um, in Jan on, in January we're starting a trial with the Wake Forest people to actually give the monkeys substance P to see if we, and follow them with CMR for fibrosis to see if we can reduce fibrosis. And we're measuring a whole bunch of markers for organ function, so for a safety point of view. But probably the end outcome is not going to be to give substance P because of, you know, it's potential side effects. We've, we need to identify the receptor the substance P is acting on and, and, and probably develop something to target that more specifically. But I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. Okay, so I like simple summaries. This is like a real simple stick figure summary of everything I just told you. So in hypertension, you get an increase in substance P, acts through the NK1 receptor to cause fibrosis. We've also shown it's not just hypertension, it's cardiotoxicity, so anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity. Uh, again, with uh, Giselle Melendez at Wake Forest, who's also involved in the monkey work, she's interested in cardiotoxicity, so we did a study with her. And um, so it's the same deal. Substance P works through the NK1 receptor to cause fibrosis in that scenario too. So what you want to do is block the NK1 receptor. So there happens to be a commercially available NK1 receptor. Merck produces it. It's only used uh, to prevent nausea and vomiting when you get chemotherapy right now. It's given for about a day, one or two days. Of course, based on our data with this, we'd argue you should continue it through the whole chemotherapy process. But So there's an NK1 receptor antagonist out there already that has literally one use. So I'm sure Merck is looking for other uses. Uh, for their compound. So it, this would be a repurposing uh, proposition, not starting from scratch. Now, diabetes is the opposite. You get this loss of substance P, predisposes the heart to developing fibrosis, uh, and the idea is to add substance P back or, or some sort of analog or something that activates the receptor that once we've identified it. It may be the NK1 receptor, it may not be. It could be one of the other neurokinin receptors. Uh, we don't know yet. But essentially, it speaks to this narrow frame of substance P concentration, too much is bad, too little is bad. And I think that's true of other neuropeptides, but certainly not just other neuropeptides. I mean, the same thing is true of adenosine, so it's probably biologically um, speaks to a lot of different molecules. All right, so future directions, just to finish up. In the hypertension study, uh, we want to look further at this regulation of myofibroblasts. So we know there's this priming effect, these other things have to take place, but how important is all that in vivo? Because a lot of that we did in vitro. So we have a uh, a mouse now with the NK1 receptor flocks, so we can knock it out cell specifically. Uh, and through collaborators, we can get uh, a mouse for fibroblasts, so we can knock it out in all fibroblasts. And then JAX has a Cree mouse for myofibroblasts, so we can contrast knocking it out in all fibroblasts versus just myofibroblasts. Uh, because I'm becoming less convinced that you have to have a myofibroblast transition, but that's a, that's a different story. 
Uh, our never-ending question of what activates these mast cells, that's, that's an ongoing thing. We have some, um, some targets that we will look at. We haven't really looked at substance pre-regulation of macrophage phenotype in the hypertensive uh, situation. And then the big one, you know, because we've been trying to understand mechanisms of activating and driving the fibrosis, we want to know whether blocking the NK1 receptor can reverse fibrosis and reverse heart failure. Uh, and that's actually probably where we'll talk to Merck about getting compound because that's obviously in their interest reversal. Uh, so that's on the hypertensive side. On the diabetes side, we need to identify the neurokinin receptor that substance P is acting through to, to um, protect against that fibrosis. We need to understand the antifibrotic mechanisms at the fibroblast level, but also the macrophage level, and that's where we think uh, reactive oxygen species comes into it. Um, but we need to look at that. And then, like I mentioned with um, Giselle and Kylie at Wake Forest, we're about to start the, the monkey study where we give them substance P. Uh, once we've identified the receptor in the mouse, we'll go back and target the receptor specifically in the monkeys too, and then we can compare and contrast substance P versus the so targeting the receptor specifically and work out what's the best uh, approach going forward. Uh, and that's the people involved. And thank you. Hi, question. Hi, go ahead. <laughs> uh, at the very beginning, you showed us a slide. I, I think maybe it had the uh, neurokinin or saprokinin receptors, and they were heterogeneously distributed. Oh, the Western blot? Was it the? So it was a very. It was like one of your first slides. Yep. I don't mean to really go back to it. Ah, sorry. It's okay. But but it raised in my. It got me thinking through the whole seminar. To what degree um, might there be localized regional effects that trigger this process, and then, and then um, other signaling pathways and other things that uh, trigger the spread of the fibrosis to the to the whole body, or or do you think it's? Uh, I'm thinking about where the release sites are, yeah. the diffusibility, the receptor so, dysfunction. Yeah, so that's the question that we ask ourselves all the time. Um, so if I go back to this one, maybe, instead of the, oh, this one. Because if you think about it, so this feeds into that mast cell stuff, too, where we did the substance P activation of mast cells, but took really high concentrations. But if you think about a mast cell sitting right next to this sensory nerve, when substance P is dumped out of that nerve, it could, those mast cells could see really high concentrations, right? So the question is, does it just happen around the sensory nerves and then other things propagate the, sim the, the signal out, or, you know, a lot of this probably gets emptied into the coronary circulation too, so then it gets funneled through the whole heart, so um, I'm not sure, and there is a small, about 5 to 10 percent of endothelial cells in the coronary arteries have substance P, so there's the potential for that to be released straight into the um, coronary circulation too, so yeah, it's a question that we think about all the time, and still don't know the answer to whether it's a, a localized and then sort of gets propagated or whether the substance piece circulates and maybe it's both maybe it's a local initial response and then it starts to, to circulate so later I, on I was wondering um, either in the clinical situation or in the lab animal are there are there data available on the dynamics of the progression which must be uh, of this this effect and and is there any sort of pattern that can be traced when you longitudinally sequentially look at the development uh, of, of the fibrosis, fibrosis? Yeah, spatially in some so I don't think there's anything done in humans because until more recently with the CMR, you haven't been able to visualize that in humans. Um, so fibro it somewhat depends on models. So like angiotensin II, it's definitely necrosis driven. So you get a necrosis of, you know, focal necrosis, very small, three, four, five myocytes get knocked out. So then that fills with fibrosis and then there's kind of like fingers spreading from that. Um, so, it can happen, yeah, it can happen both ways. These little focal necrotic spots, which end up those little scars, or just more interstitial collagen laid down between myocytes in different areas. So it doesn't have to stem from the, from the, the myocyte necrosis. So are there different mechanisms for each one? So the focal necrosis is driven by myocyte death, which is driven by ANG2 causing norepi release. So you basically poison these cells, small areas, right? Well, there's data from way back that substance P causes norepi release. So that could be driving that necrosis. This was actually in the R01 to look at this. Um, so it could be driving that necrosis by regulating norepi. We haven't looked at that yet. Um, so 
But then interstitially, the fibrosis where you get more thicker collagen fibers, that's not a myocyte death trigger. So is that more mast cell related? So those mast cells happen to be in those areas and are activated and cause that sort of fibrosis. To my knowledge, we don't know that. I don't know if you have any. To my knowledge, we don't know those sort of dif uh, differences. Yeah. No idea. <laughs> is this is it the in situ hybridization or was it for Don't miss it. Don't go too far. Short answer is no idea. Um, but it's a good <laughs> something to look at. I mean, so there are only a, a couple of groups, a few groups, handful, half dozen groups that look at substance P in the heart uh, specifically. So, yeah, pretty much everything is new for the most part. There's lots, lots known about physio the physiology of substance P that was done back in the 80s, early 90s. But in terms of pathology, um, it's, it's all new. So, yeah, there's a million things that we want to do, but it's the you know, age-old problem, right? Money and manpower to get those things done. So we never got to a real myofibroblast phenotype. So when we added the substance P, they, they never, so EDA fibrodectin is an early marker. They never made that conversion when we just gave substance P. And they didn't increase fibrosis either. But we do have, but we do know that in, v, uh, in vivo, sorry, we do get less myofibroblast. So it's clearly not through a direct effect uh, at the fibroblast, but it's, it may be through the endothelium, through the mast cells. It's, it's very much this indirect Effect. And I think the reason it's like this is because, again, getting back to where substance P is located in those sensory nerves on the coronary vessels, well, if you exercise, you're going to get increased coronary pressure. Substance P is probably going to get released. So you can't have it switching on a profibrotic pathway just because you exercise on a regular basis, right? It's got to, so it needs to be a chronic upregulation, but then even within that, there's these series of steps that have to happen for the process to proceed. So it's, it's almost like safety net built in. Like you have to have this perfect storm of events for fibrosis to proceed. So, so the, the direct effects on the fibroblasts are very much a priming type effect. You know, upregulate some genes, upregulate some receptors. But within the tissue, if it's chronically upregulated, then you also upregulate the ligands that activate those receptors. So it's... I think it's a safety mechanism just so you just don't get fibrosis happen because there's increased substance P there, if that makes sense. So, so the TGF beta stuff we've done has been in the whole heart. And the, with ANG2, you get increased TGF-beta. If we knock out substance P, we don't see the increase in TGF-beta. But that's in the whole heart. That's not looking, you know, direct effects on the fibroblast yet. That's why I didn't put it up there, because that's literally all we have so far in the TGF, is just that knocking out substance P stops that increase in TGF. We haven't gone any further with that yet. Um. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So, so the question is, the, the mouse model of diabetes also has obesity. So what's more important, the diabetes or the obesity? Uh, my gut feeling is diabetes, just because you're getting the peripheral nerve degeneration. So you're taking away the substance P because the nerves are dying. Um, 
so, I mean, again, this is pure speculation, but I, my gut feeling is the diabetes is, is the more important. Now, all we want to do is take a look in maybe type 1 diabetic model and see, yeah, so you don't have the obesity, but you see whether we get that loss of substance P. And they're both develop fibrosis, right? I mean, type 1 diabetes develops fibrosis. Um, so, so the, you, you mostly would have just focused on the lesion potential for MIK, mm -hmm. but you know, earlier in the talk you showed very nice pictures of the interior of the heat bubble. And the oh, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't us. That was, that was someone else. Yeah. So I, I guess the extension is, you know, uh, and, and, get, and you know, given, given the role of combustion system and the movement of the heart and the way you um, depletion of So certainly, like uh, MP, MPY is proarrhythmogenic. Um, I've never seen anything about substance P and arrhythmias, uh, but yeah, certainly MPY because MPY works in conjunction with uh, norepi, so it's contained in the sympathetic nerves with norepi and it gets released with norepi, so it, it helps to drive. Um, there's been quite a bit of work done by um, a guy in the UK on on uh, MPY and. Um, uh, arrhythmias. Right. So certainly there's effects uh, at the atrial level because there's a lot more innovation at the atria too. There's a lot more substance P, there's a lot more MPY, there's a lot more everything right. in the atria. Right. Uh, is it linked to atrial arrhythmia? Is it um, uh, decreases or increases? In substance P, uh, nobody's looked at substance P. M MPY is the main one that's been looked at in that situation. I guess because of its relationship with norepi. Uh, but substance P has not been looked at in terms of arrhythmias. 